I'm excited to continue our series on generosity. Who's been here the last couple weeks and heard Phil open up our series on generosity? Okay, got a couple hands, that's good. So I have the easy task, I just have one phrase that I'm covering, and it's this one. I am determined to increase in generosity until it can be said that there is no need among us. And this is my favorite part of the giving liturgy, and I think this is why Phil gave it to me to do. Because imagine, imagine walking through the the doors of this church and this being a place where there is no need among us. No need. No financial need, no emotional need, no physical need, no spiritual need. Granted, we're always going to need more of God, right? But that there was no need among us. Like, that's a radical thought. I mean, that, that, that's heaven. But there's something, for I think, for us to get in that. And so when we think about generosity, I think it's important to not only think about financial generosity. It's to think about that person that you know that you're like, she has the most generous heart. Or he is so generous with his home. He always has people over. Or she's so generous with her time. Or David and I like to say we're very generous huggers. We love to give physically. Like if you need a hug, find David, find me. We will hug you. And I've been told that um, sometimes I hold a hug just a little too long. So because I think I'm like just kind of thinking about the person and like going, oh, oh, you know. And they're like, I was done. So, you know, if that happens, I'm just letting you know in advance. Um, but it kind of matches the needs. Like, aren't our needs very holistic? We, when you walk through the doors of this church, did you walk in here with only a financial need? You probably walked in here with, with a lot of emotional needs, uh, wanting to connect with people, know people, be known. And so when we think about generosity, and it's really the heart of God. It's a holistic generosity meeting a holistic need. So here's the thing. We talk a lot in our church about um, a, a communal faith, that we're not individualistic Christian, Christians that just go and have a quiet time by ourselves in our room, and that's the end of the story. We believe that being a part of church, being a part of community matters. But today, the conversation that I have for us is actually an individual conversation, and it starts with that word, I. I am determined. So I'm gonna actually ask us to make a choice today, to make a personal commitment today, to choose to be determined, to choose to be all in. And I'm gonna get to what I mean by that. But to make a personal decision to be determined to increase in generosity so that there be no need among us. It really is a personal, individual choice that's gonna affect this. Because let me ask you a question. Who do you sacrifice for? Is there anyone in your life that you sacrifice for? Maybe you'd sacrifice for um, your husband or wife or child or family member, maybe. But let's paint this picture. We're constantly getting bombarded with needs on the internet, on Facebook, stuff that happens. What if we heard tragically that here in Smyrna, someone's house burned down, like burned to the ground, melted the cars in the garage, just a, a horrible, tragic fire. That's awful. But we're just not really able to respond to every need, right? And it it can be overwhelming to the point where we do nothing. But what if the person's house that burned down, sorry about this dad, but this is the analogy I've been using. Uh, This is my dad, by the way. Uh, That it was your dad's house or your mom's house. It changes it, right? It changes how you respond. Because immediately I'd be like, oh my gosh, you know, okay, who do I know in insurance that like can help them file their claims? Who do I know that has like a room they could live in? Or, you know, who do they know? Who do I know? um, Gosh, do I have an extra car? Could they just drive that this thing that doesn't run? I'll get it fixed really quick and they could drive it. Like generosity is super easy because I have a connection. These are people I'm close with. These are family. And I believe we feel the same way about friends that are close with us. Whoever is family to you, it's not hard to sacrifice for, right? And be generous with. So the first way that I believe that we can take steps towards being a community that looks like heaven, that looks like people that meet every need with a holistic generosity is this, that we grow close to others in community. That's the first way. 
I'll use some examples from our missional community group. And missional community is the method that we use, is a structure that we use in, in this church to get close, like small groups, but we call them missional community groups, and they're a little bit different. But our missional community group, um, I'll just brag on a few of them. So starting last spring, we just saw God move, and it was through the power of community. Um, I asked in advance and got permission to just kind of share some personal things from our group. Linda, our famous reader, um, last spring, emergently, had to have surgery. And she had grown in our group to, to trust us and need us. And she allowed us to be in her life. Um, maybe for the first time, letting others in that way. You just, you just let me share all your stuff, right? <laughs> I love you, Linda. <laughs> and, and was really blessed by that, allowing others to meet her, be with her in the hospital, serve her as much as we were able. But you know what? Just a very short time after that, there was a need presented to her. There was a family in need, and she took in two little girls into her home. So it was just this like, you know, boom, turn, boom. And you learn generosity when you receive generosity. And a great place to start is in our communities and people that we learn to become family with. And so that, I just thought was such a great example. Also, um, there was a woman in our group over the summer, single mom, had not been able to find a job and her finances were just dwindling. And I think she just privately shared with somebody that she just couldn't even make rent. And Jules, one of the girls in our group, um, and I point this out, I'm technically the leader, but I think it's such a healthy group when nobody waits, they just do it. And that's good. She's like blowing up our little group me like, guys, you need to ask God how much you can give. And we all gave and to the glory of God within a few days time raised like $1,000 to help this woman. And like, that's the community. And the it wasn't announced up here. I don't think really even many people at church knew. But that's the generosity of a family that knows each other, that, that hurts when other people hurt. So the second way is to ask God how you should respond to the needs you encounter. So this kind of goes back to the inundation that we get with all the social media, all the needs of the world. It is overwhelming that it numbs us to, to nothing, right? We do nothing. So let's say, like, like in Linda's story, she was presented with a family with a need. Ask God, is this something that I need to respond to? Because you know what? He's going to give you the ability to do it. He's going to give you the resources to do this. So this is a holistic generosity that offers your influence. What do you, what do, you do for a living? Do you have resources and influence that might be able to help somebody else? Um, you know, who, where do your kids go to school? Who are you in relationship with? It's a holistic helping of needs. Maybe there's young people in our church. There are young people in our church that need jobs, that need career counseling. Maybe you can help them in that way. This is a big picture to make a healthy family. When I was um, 17, I, I gave my life officially to Jesus, made my commitment to him. And in the Bible that mom gave me when I was 16, my pink Bible, I wrote in the front, a quote that I heard from Bill Bright. Maybe, many of you may be familiar with him, the founder of Campus Crusade. that's now called Crew. And he had this great saying that it really I latched onto, and it said, God, break my heart for the things that break yours. God, break my heart for the things that break yours. And I wrote it in the front of my Bible, and I was just so, you know, excited. But generosity is one of those things that I don't think can really be sustainable or really work very well unless our hearts are changed, unless our hearts are broken for the things that, that breaks God's heart. Then flowing from there is easy. But here's the problem. Here's the block. And this is the third thing. We need to destroy any idols that we have in our life, anything that comes before complete worship to God. And you might be like, oh, great, I came on this Sunday. They're going to talk about idols. Fantastic. But here's the thing. This is just the Christian life. Um, think about Israel throughout the Old Testament. What was the thing that they kept getting stuck on, that get, God kept calling out in their life to stop doing? It was worshiping other gods, right? We as human beings can't help but be like many idol factories. It's just what we do. It's easier to trust this fake thing than to trust that this God Almighty that we don't even see can actually provide for us and is actually trustworthy. 
So here's how you can identify what's an idol, because I doubt many of you are going to go home after church today and light your little candle and bow down in your room to your carved image, right? So they've got to be existing in different forms. It, you can find it this way. Where, where do you have the little mouse on the wheel? And it goes like this. If you could just do this, if you could just get their approval, if you could just make some more money and get that bigger house that looks really nice and marry the pretty girl and go to college and get a law degree, then your father will approve of you. Then you'll have recognition in your community. Then they'll think you've arrived. Then your mom will finally think you're good enough. The wheel that just goes, and you know what? Sadly, that's actually a false God that we worship because we have to do that before we can do anything else. It's actually a false God. And let me show you what God and I do. This is our thing. So God is, is regularly identifying things that are off in my life. So it's, it's not a sign of immaturity. It's not a sign of disobedience when these things come up. So you don't need to feel shame. It's actually, I'm to the point now where I'm like, just please show me. I just don't want to be stuck anymore. Just show me. Because I trust him that he's good. He's not going to hurt me. So once I identify something, I actually have gotten in this habit that I imagine, like literally a, a, a vessel, like a clay vessel, that it represents it or whatever. And I tell God that, I, I'm, that I'm repenting. Confession and repentance is one of the most powerful tools in the life of the believer. Is you're actually breaking agreement with stuff that you shouldn't be in relationship with. That's called bondage. So I imagine this clay pot in my mind, set it on the floor, and I stomp it and I break it. And I say, God, I repent from believing that lie. I repent from obeying that pressure. And what do you have for me instead? And God is so faithful to just give me something else. Give me the true thing that I'm supposed to be going after. And then I tell him, okay, I'm worshiping you and I'm running after that instead. And then as, as temptation comes or I feel drawn back to that thing, I say, no, I, I've repented from that and I'm following this. And it's the process of taking your thoughts captive and walking in obedience. And this is the process of freedom in your life. It is for freedom that he has set us free. It is for freedom that he has set you free. Jesus died on the cross for all of this. So if things are coming up in your heart, in your life that you're in bondage to, Take time with God to break your worship to that. Because here's the thing. Let's say, for example, I had a major issue with people pleasing. And I needed to be, I just needed to be noticed and recognized constantly. And let's say, like, all I wanted was time with Phil, you know. And I come to church, and all I care about is for Phil to notice me. And I'm here, and I'm just, like, waiting for a moment, you know, waiting for my moment. And I neglect to see the woman that walks in the door here because I'm so occupied with myself, my own brokenness. But let's say I'm, in a, I'm, I'm, I'm walking in a healthy place. I've broken those idols, and I'm like, I love Phil. We can talk later, you know? I'm good. I don't need people to see me talking to him, because I'm good. My value is here in the Lord. I'm good. All of a sudden, I notice the woman that walks in the door over here, and I greet her, and I say, hello. Nice to meet you. I'm April. And let's say she tells me that her mom just died. Whoa, I would have missed that completely because I'm so wrapped up in myself. See, generosity and being available to be on mission with Jesus is so connected to our own personal health and healing. If you want to be generous in the hands and feet of Jesus, we have got to get free from the stuff that we're attached to, and Jesus sets us free. So do you guys want this? It sounds good, right? So the fourth thing is we need to renew our commitment to be all in. This is the decision, this is the commitment that I mentioned at the beginning that I'm going to ask us to do today. I'm going to ask you to decide whether or not you want to be all in today. And maybe there's going to be a lot of all ins over your whole life, and that's great. So imagine this. Does anybody here play poker? Okay, this is, oh, this, you're so awesome. Okay, this is, 
Every service I've asked, and then I've laughed because no one wants to, bl- to admit, like, it's bad. And then I laugh and ask again, and, like, you know, 20 people raise their hand. So poker's okay. <laughs> so, you know, in that game, you typically have chips, right, which recommend, re- represent your money. So imagine in your life, you have a stack of chips that represent the different categories of your life. Let's say your green stack of chips is your sexuality, Let's say the white stack of chips is kind of like your hopes and desires for the future. Uh, Let's say like in my life to have children, you know, what you long for, these deep desires, maybe to be married. Um, Another stack, this brown stack over here, is your career, and it's your influence in the community, maybe your worth. Over here in blue is, is your actual finances. Over here is your relationships. I mean, you, you see where I'm going. And maybe over your life, as you, maybe you attended youth group, they did a really good job of teaching you to obey God and wait till marriage to have sex. And maybe over here, you had, a, you had really good teaching on finances and you've been really obedient with the Lord to, in that way. But as you scan back, you realize there's several things over here, which is fantastic. It's really fantastic. But there's several things that are still over here. And today, I believe the Lord is inviting us to take all of our chips and to be all in, all in. See, with poker, and I'm no expert, but I do know that you're like hoping their hand is terrible and that you're going to win, right? So you're like, I got this. I'm all in, right? Or maybe you're really skilled and you know you have the upper hand. But here's the thing. This is a bet on the character of God. You're going all in on who God is. And here's the thing. When we are like, ooh, (laughs) ooh, especially on certain areas, there's something there. there. There's a disconnect in our ability to trust God in that area. And there's probably idolatry attached in there because there's something else that can provide better for us than God. There's something else that we can rely on more than God. And you know what, guys? It's okay. We're all in the process together. But the opportunity is to go, I'm just, I don't have this figured out, but I trust God. I know he's faithful. I know he's good. I know I can trust him. Because this is a good God that loves me. He's a good father. He says he cares even for the birds of the air. How much more valuable am I? I'm just going to take a gamble on God. And I'm going to go all in today. I'm going to go all in. And you know what? You actually can do that. This is an investment in life you can do without knowing the full research of the the investment because he is faithful. He's got it figured out. So the, the request today is will you go all in with God? And where you feel blocks, I just invite you to explore that with God and let him minister to you. Acts chapter two is a really, really interesting book of the Bible. And um, quickly becoming one of my very favorite in my life right now. If you're new to this whole what, Holy Spirit thing and you're like, what in the world? Um, just want to give you like a quick resource. Uh, it's like this, 2-2. Two, two. Joel chapter 2 in the Old Testament prophesies of all the stuff that's going to happen with the coming of the Holy Spirit, that it was the original plan. And then Acts chapter 2 is where it actually happens. So Joel 2, Acts 2. If you want to research it, get a little bit more equipped, that's a great place. And Acts chapter 2 starts out in verse 1 with saying, they came together on Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit filled them. So this is different from before when the Holy Spirit would just rest upon people in the Old Testament, prophets, priests, and kings. It was like a temporary anointing, if you can think about it this way. But the prophet said, a day is coming when you're going to be filled. Everyone, young, old, influence, poorest, doesn't matter. And that's what happened at Pentecost because of Jesus' death and resurrection. So there's this group of people waiting in the upper room, and they get poured out on, right? We all, a lot of us know the story. We've taught it a lot here. But what I want to point out is what happens to Peter. So the people in the city think they're drunk because they're speaking in tongues. They're like, what in the world are you doing? But Peter goes, actually, we're not drunk. Here's what's happening. And if you can remember for a moment who Peter was like a day ago, practically, He was the one that did what three times before the crow crowed? Denied, right? 
He's the one that said he didn't even know Jesus and ran away. He was hot-headed, unpredictable, and flaky. But Jesus called him the rock on which he would build his church. Jesus was prophesying who this man would become. And he was able to become this man because of the filling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not an experience. It's a person that empowers us to live differently. And I love how obvious, if you have time, you should read through this. Peter gets up there and he's like, guys, we're not drunk. Let me tell you what's up. Actually, this Jesus of Nazareth who you crucified and then goes through the whole history of their Jewish faith and points out how Jesus has perfectly fulfilled prophecy. But here's what happens. It was a Holy Spirit filled speaking. It wasn't that it was just so amazing. And that's what our lives are with the Holy Spirit. It's empowered. This is what they said. And this is what I want us to see. In 2, 37 and 38, their response was, what now shall we do? The Bible says they were cut to the heart. They said, what should we do? Oh my gosh, I can't believe this is what we've done. I believe it was a type of what should we do that we have in our worst moments. Maybe some of us have been there in the pit of life where you've lost a marriage or a child you're depressed, your finances are in the toilet, and you look at a friend and you say, what do I do? You would do anything. They were asking Peter, what do we do? They would do anything. These people were chips all in. If he had told them to do the craziest stuff, they would have done it. Anything, we're all in. So they continue to see signs and miracles and movement of the Holy Spirit. But let's look at what happened to the people. Look in Acts 2, 42. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers, and awe came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, And breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts and praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Awesome, right? Like the dream. But I don't think it has to be a dream. I believe we're taking steps towards this. And this doesn't mean that we have to join a hippie commune and give away all our stuff. It means that we start changing our heart. It begins with a heart attitude. And today, I believe the Lord is giving us an opportunity to commit to that. One of the other guys in our group, I mentioned this first and third service, and he was in second. So I told him, like, I I talked about you first service. It's a guy named Drew. Many of you know him. And he has been stirred by the Lord to, to minister to people that are in slavery in the sex industry. And that's our unique calling, and that's a powerful calling. And we support him as a church and as a missional community group. And he has received the heart of God for the broken. So as we commit to community and we serve those that we're family with, God will also begin to stir us to be the hands and feet of Jesus around the world. And sometimes that'll be a financial give, and that's right. But this is where it comes back to ask God how you should respond. So I just want to share a couple of scriptures that, that share God's heart in this way. And then I want to reword, of them, reword one of them for us to receive over ourselves. So in Psalm 68, 5, it says, He is the father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. That's who God is. He executes judge, uh, justice for the fatherless and the widow Loves a sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Deuteronomy 10, 18. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to visit the orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And the last one, but you, God, see the trouble of the afflicted. You consider their grief and take it in hand. The victims commit themselves to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. And I just felt like I wanted to reword that because the the Bible says, Jesus said that we will continue the works that he began to do. And we do that through the empowering of the Holy Spirit because in our own strength, we can do only so much, right? So let me reword this and read it over you. And if you would receive it over yourself as a commission to participate in God's work. 
You see the trouble of the afflicted. You consider their grief and take it in hand. The victims commit themselves to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Don't you want to be a part of that? Don't you want to be a part of something that matters? And you can't do everything. So what about today, taking those things that are left behind that are holding you captive, that are occupying too much of your energy, and just saying, today, God, we're in, and I want a life of community. I want to be a generous person with my time, my emotions, my mental, everything. And and I want to reach the needs of my local community. But I also want to hear from you. What have you called me to do that reaches the orphan and the fatherless and, and those that need help across the world? What have you called me to participate in your worldwide love? You actually are designed for, for mission. And that's right here and everywhere, wherever God has designed you. So I'm just going to invite the worship team up. And we're going to close with a song. And I just want to invite you guys, what we're going to do, and this is not to, like, call anybody out, make anybody uncomfortable, um, but we're made space at the altar. I want to ask you, if God has stirred anything in your heart today, if there's any stacks behind, and to be truthful, it's probably all of us to some degree, um, that you want to make a decision today and say, God, I'm all in. I want to invite you to come and kneel at the altar and pray and say, I'm all in today, God. And then at the end, we'll have prayer counselors available to pray for you guys. And if you don't know Jesus yet as your Savior, I want to invite you to come forward and and talk with someone, pray with someone. We would love to talk with you because he is the one that has the power to set you free. This is not your own working it out. It's Jesus' death and resurrection that has the power to set you free. So would you stand with me? I'm just going to pray over you guys my privilege to pray over you guys. Holy Spirit, I just thank you for your work. We just want to participate with what you're doing. Praise you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Just release your love in this room. God, we just come against, I come against hopelessness in the name of Jesus. Um, Any despair, God, we just come against. And God, I thank you for those seeds of hope that you were planting early in the service. And um, yeah, I just thank you that you're gonna bring it to fruition in some lives here. God, I pray for any hopelessness attached to to barrenness of children and, and joblessness. We just come against that in the name of Jesus. And God, I thank you for your hope and your future, your newness of life that you have in all those places. God, we pray um, just against financial despair. God, would you just create a new way, a new way. You'd you'd repair the debt. You'd you'd bring freedom and you'd bring blessing so um, so they would be free and be able to be a blessing to others. So I just thank you, God, for what you're doing right now. And we receive your love. And I pray this in Jesus' name.